Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Northwood University Freedom Seminar 2021. My name is Dale Machek. I'm the chairman of the economics program at Northwood University. I'm also the academic director for the Freedom Seminar, and I'm glad you could join us tonight. Uh, as you may be aware, the theme of this year's Freedom Seminar is liberty and justice for all. And we are focusing on issues of civil rights and equality in the United States. And tonight I'm here to introduce the whole program to you. Before I begin, I want to um, acknowledge the generous support of the McNair Center for the Advancement of Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise at Northwood University. Uh, and um, I, I, I want to thank them for their uh, continuing support of our programs. Um, so here's the plan. Tonight, we're going to screen a wonderful documentary about the life of Thomas Sowell. Uh, before I introduce the documentary, I, I want to introduce the whole Freedom Seminar program. After the documentary, I'm going to be introducing the filmmaker, Wall Street Journal columnist, uh, Jason Riley and he's going to give his presentation. Now, after his presentation, or even during his presentation, if questions occur to you, I want you to use the Q&A option on the right-hand side of your screen, post those questions. Of course, you can use the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen uh, to chat with each other during the movie or during the presentations. If you're registered for the Freedom Seminar as a guest, we do have a discussion community, or if you're registered as a student, uh, we do have a discussion community available. I sent a link out by email yesterday, and you can join us to continue the discussion after the presentation is over. Now, with those preliminaries out of the way, I would like to tell you a little bit about the uh, the agenda this weekend. So. Let me share my screen with you. So, as I said earlier, uh, this is going to focus on uh, issues of equality and race relations and gender equality as well. Um, and as I thought about this, this year's theme, uh, the idea occurred to me to organize it uh, around the theme of the American dream. Perhaps I should use the plural, American dreams, um, because I, I think it's very appropriate for Northwood University uh, for this particular theme for a few reasons, which I'll explain to you. So first of all, when we say the American dream, a lot of us have heard that phrase so often that we may not actually be aware of what it means or, or where it comes from. It actually originated uh, with a book written by James Truslow Adams back in 1931, he published it. And here's what he had to say about the American dream. America's distinctive and unique gift to mankind has been the American dream. It is not a dream of motor cars and high wages merely, but a dream of a social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain to the fullest statute of which they are innately capable, unhampered by the barriers which had slowly been erected in older civilizations, unrepressed by social orders which had been developed for the benefit of classes rather than for the simple human being of any and every class. And that dream has been realized more fully in actual life here than anywhere else, though very imperfectly, even among ourselves. Now, there's a lot here, but the one thing that might uh, stand out to us is that this is not the house, the two car garage, the high paying job. He's actually describing a social order in which each of us is treated as an individual human being, and that without respect to who our parents were, 
We're not treated as members of a class. We're treated by others and respected by others for the unique person that we are. And what is attractive to this for people is that they can aspire, pursue whatever their ambition and their capability will enable them to achieve. So this is the American dream. It's not just an individual dream, but it's made possible by a social order in which each of us are human beings equal in moral value to anybody else in our society. This, I think, uh, could use even more emphasis. Um, this is, again, uh, James Treslow Adams in his book, of the Epic of America. He says, I once had an intelligent young Frenchman as a guest in New York, and after a few days I asked him what struck him most among his new impressions. Without hesitation, he replied, the way that everyone of every sort looks you right in the eye without a thought of inequality. Some time ago, a foreigner who used to do some work for me and who had picked up a very fair education occasionally sat and chatted with me in my study after I'd finished my work. One day he said that such a relationship was the great difference between America and his homeland. There he said, I would do my work and might get a pleasant word, but I could never sit and talk like this. There's a difference there between social grades which cannot be got over. I would not talk to you there as man to man, but as my employer. So we can see in the context provided here that there is something in America, some people call this, you know, democracy or equality, whatever it happens, whatever, whatever label you attach to it, we are looking each other in the eye and we recognize somebody who is, for all practical purposes, no matter what their line of work or social background, our equal. Now I wanna relate James Treslow Adams' version of the American dream with the Northwood idea. And many of you, most of you, I gather, are either students or graduates of Northwood University, so you will be familiar with the tenets of the Northwood idea as outlined by Orville Watts. And you can see them listed here, um, the importance of individual freedom and responsibility constrained by moral law, the emphasis on work and thrift and the importance of free enterprise. But these, according to Orville Watts, are not the most distinctive features of the Northwood idea. If you can imagine, these are kind of a prescription, a way to pursue the American dream successfully. What he really cares about is that Northwood equips its graduates to succeed in their version of the American dream. In fact, here's the way that Orville Watts puts it at the end of his essay on the Northwood idea. He says, the most distinctive feature of the Northwood idea is the view that our graduates should look on business not merely as an easier way to attain ease and affluence, but also as an opportunity for utilizing their highest human qualities and attaining lasting satisfaction in a life well spent. So what should jump out at us as we read this quote? Thinking just a few moments ago after reading James Treslow Adams, his description of the American dream, we immediately see the parallel. It is not merely chasing after money. It is not pursuit of the easy life. It is the strenuous life, a life to make something of ourselves, a life that is about being a person of value, not simply achieving a material rewards. So this is really what we try to, uh, what we aspire to at Northwood for our graduates. And uh, it, it really is um, the American dream. And that's what makes, I think, Martin Luther King's speech, his famous speech during the March on Washington, the original March in 1963, on this 100 year anniversary 
of the Emancipation, he, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, he gave his speech and he chose as his theme, the American dream. So here's what he had to say about it. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I love this photograph of Martin Luther King. He's such a young man here. I can't remember how old he was. I think he was, I don't even know if he had yet turned 30. But he was a man of faith, and I believe that he was divinely inspired to choose this particular theme because it was a theme that resonated with Americans because it does have something to do with our common experience. It has something to do with our common values. And there are people that use the phrase that there's unity and diversity, but I wanna tell you, diversity makes political unity very difficult. You need some common ground in order to forge some kind of political unity and, and to keep you know, many different kinds of people together. And this American dream and his affirmation of it gave us that unifying principle. Now we have difficult times today. This past summer and in the past few years, we've seen uh, terrible incidents which have uh, given rise to peaceful protests and demonstrations, but also more violent protests and uh, a, a demand for many people uh, for, for renewed uh, change. I believe that we need to look to Martin Luther King for inspiration because I believe that his principles still forms a solid foundation that will unite us. And uh, though we are deeply divided now, and we are, um, I, I believe that is the way forward. Now, of course, not everybody would agree with me on this. Um, the civil rights movement has evolved over the last 50 years. And uh, there are reasons for that. One of the biggest challenges to um, the original civil rights movement. And by the way, Dr. King's uh, idea here was essentially liberal. And that was in the long tradition of the fight for equality and civil rights in America. Uh, Frederick Douglass, you know, a hundred years before him, um, Booker T. Washington, uh, Susan B. Anthony, they all appealed to Americans to live up to their ideals. They never rejected those ideals. They affirmed them. They were proud of them. They only said, make sure that every American can live in a country where those ideals are honored. And that's the way it was for a long time. Now today, of course, there's a different strategy being used. And it presents a challenge to the liberal order. I'm using liberal here in its original sense, being rooted in liberty, the idea of individual rights, the principles of people like John Locke, uh, that we have an equal right to our life, liberty, and property. This is what we mean by the liberal ideal. It's 
the philosophy that's embedded in our Declaration of Independence and uh, institutionalized in our Constitution. So the challenge to this today uh, comes to us from you know, many different uh, places, but I'll focus on critical race theory, which is an academic theory, and it might be more properly called a movement than a theory, because its entire purpose is to change America or to change institutions. And uh, those who practice it explicitly reject the earlier approach to civil rights and equality. This is a quote taken from a textbook in critical race theory. This is written by Richard Delgado and, and John Stefanczyk. It's called Critical Race Theory and Introduction, but here's what they say. Unlike traditional civil rights, which embraces incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundations of the liberal order including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, neutral principles of constitutional law, they are also highly suspicious of another liberal mainstay, namely rights. Now this is very explicit, but it's, it's something that not many people are aware of. But we should be aware of it, because if you believe in the liberal order, if you value the principles on which this country is founded, this is frankly a, a very important challenge, those principles. And it is disproportionately influential outside of the small numbers of people who actually understand it, study it. It, it took hold in academia. It is now firmly entrenched in uh, most colleges and universities. and. Uh, making its way into uh, the lower levels of our educational system. It has also found a very strong uh, place in corporate America and in corporate culture. And, you know, maybe this is good. There are reasons why people rejected liberalism as espoused by the civil rights leaders in the middle of the 20th century and why they are moving in a new direction. Um, you know, they are concerned about the lack of progress. They are concerned about uh, highly um, visible disparities. But we have to recognize it for what it is. It is a challenge to the liberal order. Now, this weekend, I have invited people to talk about many different aspects of this battle of ideas that's taking place. I've invited business leaders to inspire you. We have uh, invited uh, people who have lived the American dream and, and understand it uh, from their own experience, but we've also invited academics who study it, who look at the data, who, who try and figure out exactly what's going on and where do we stand with these with respect to these important issues. Uh, I think it's going to be a very educational three days, but it is no substitute for the additional work that you need to do when this weekend is over. I hope that you will be inspired to study more, to read more, to educate yourself, because we can't afford to be neutral when a battle of this kind of importance is taking place for the future of our country. So once again, I thank you for joining us this weekend. And I am um, going to go back. To the meeting now. And at this point, I would like to introduce the film you're about to see. And then after that, I invite you to stay tuned for our presentation by our keynote speaker, Jason Riley. Jason Riley is the producer of this film, uh, but was, it was made possible by Free to Choose Network. And I don't want to uh, forget to mention that Free to Choose Network was founded by a great man, Bob Chittister, 
who passed away just this past week. And it's because of Bob Chittister's uh, dedication and his entrepreneurial spirit and his um, firm belief in the importance of ideas that we have documentaries like this. In any case, Free to Choose Network has produced this documentary on the life of Thomas Sowell. Now, I hope that we will all take Thomas Sowell as a kind of role model for our role as students of these issues, because that's what Thomas Sowell is. He is a student. He is incredibly rigorous in examining the data, in looking at cause and effect, and not being satisfied with uh, simple answers, but looking more deeply for the root causes, racial disparities and, and other social phenomena. I believe that he is one of the great American economists and intellectuals of this past century. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to introduce him through this documentary to you tonight. So I'm going to ask um, Dale or Dan, to start the video, please enjoy uh, this documentary on the life of Thomas Sowell. I would like you folks to stick around for Jason Riley's presentation. Jason, are you with us? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, I have not yet introduced you. We just uh, finished screening your documentary on Thomas Sowell. I must say we enjoyed that. And you may get a few questions on that in addition to the other questions you may get on your presentation. I want to uh, remind our students who are with us uh, and who are taking this for academic credit Stick around after Jason Riley's uh, presentation tonight. I'd like to talk to you about the academic requirements and answer your questions. For the rest of you who are just joining us at this point, welcome to the Northwood University Freedom Seminar. Our keynote speaker is Jason Riley. And uh, Jason is, I'm sure, familiar to many of you. He has a regular column in the Wall Street Journal called Upward Mobility. Uh, he's been featured in the Wall Street Journal since 2016. He's also a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and provides television commentary for various news outlets. He joined the Wall Street Journal in 1994 and was named a senior editorial writer in the year 2000 and a member of the editorial board in 2005. Um, in addition to the documentary, which you just saw, he has a new book out called Maverick. A biography of Thomas Sowell. At least I think it's available now. Jason? It will be out on May 25th. Okay. And uh, he's he's also the author of many other books, including Let Them In, The Case for Open Borders, and Please Stop Helping Us, How Liberals Make It Harder for Blacks to Succeed, and False Black Power. And uh, he has worked for USA Today and Buffalo News. And uh, I'd like you to please welcome uh, Jason Riley. Thank you, Jason. Well, thank you uh, for that introduction, uh, Professor. Um, and thank you for the opportunity and the invitation to be here uh, today. I've been speaking to college students for a long time, and I've learned not to take these opportunities for granted anymore. Um, I don't think you can do that given what's been going on in academia recently. Um, a few years ago, the University of Chicago began sending out letters to incoming freshmen that explained the school's commitment to academic freedom and diversity of thought, how they don't support trigger warnings and safe spaces or cancel invited speakers because the topic might prove controversial. Uh, that used to go without saying on college campuses. It used to be understood. Now it needs to be stated explicitly in writing to new students. 
which says something about where we are today uh, and not something good. Uh, a couple years ago, a study was released on free speech, University of North Carolina. Uh, it concluded that conservative students are four times as likely as liberal students to worry about being open about their views with faculty out of concern for retaliation. This isn't right. It's not what college is supposed to be about. I think college ought to be a place where students are exposed to different points of view, where their sensibilities are challenged, where they learn to grapple with alternative perspectives and formulate coherent responses to those perspectives, where you learn the difference between a slogan and an argument. Uh, on a lot of campuses today, that's not happening, or at least it's not happening to the extent that it should be. So I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be uh, doing this. I, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about policing and the role it plays in racial inequality. It's a debate that, of course, reached a sort of fever pitch last summer with the George Floyd protest. Um, the entire nation, or so it seemed, came to agree that policing was a major problem in our inner cities, that it was exacerbating racial inequality. But as I watched this play out, that narrative didn't seem quite right to me. Uh, I've lived in low income black neighborhoods, gone to school in these neighborhoods, worked in these communities, and I can't recall the police ever being perceived as a bigger problem than the criminals. So as I watched this play out in the media over the summer, I was skeptical. Were the people who were sounding off on television and Twitter really representative of the people who live in these communities? Let me offer you some data. In a Gallup poll released last year, 81% of black Americans, 81% said they wanted police presence in their neighborhood to either remain the same or to increase. Just 19% said they wanted it to decrease. Another Gallup poll released a year earlier asked black and Hispanic residents of low-income neighborhoods in particular about policing. 59% of both blacks and Hispanics said, quote, they would like the police to spend more time in their area than they currently do, unquote. In 2015, which is after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, a poll found that a majority of black respondents said police treat them fairly and far more blacks than whites, by a two to one margin in fact, said they quote, want a greater police presence in their communities. Again, that's after Ferguson went down. Nor is this a recent phenomenon. Crime control has been a priority of blacks for a long time. In 1993, a Gallup poll found that 82% of black respondents that the criminal justice system doesn't treat criminals harshly enough. 75% of blacks wanted more cops on the streets to combat crime. And 68% said we ought to build more prisons so that longer sentences can be given. So just to be clear, it's fine to advocate for fewer police or for spending less money on policing and so forth. But let's not pretend that this is anything close to the view of most black people, and especially most black people who live in high crime areas. This is the view of elites, black elites, in the media, in politics, in academia, among activists, and they are for the most part speaking for themselves. I'd also note that while there's a huge gap between the view of these black elites and most black people today, this wasn't always the case. A few years ago, I wrote a column in the Wall Street Journal on the prevalence of violent crime in poor black neighborhoods. In the column, I used a quote from Martin Luther King. 
who once said to a black congregation, quote, do you know that Negroes are 10% of the population in St. Louis and responsible for 58% of the crimes? King said, we've got to face that. We've got to do something about our moral standards. He said, we know there are many things wrong in the white world, but there are many things wrong in the black world too. We can't keep on blaming the white man. There are things we must do for ourselves. After the column ran, a number of readers contacted the paper, accused me of making up the quote, which comes from a 1961 profile of King written by the famous black author James Baldwin in Harper's Magazine. Now, I was a little surprised by this reaction because all you have to do these days is Google the quote to find the source. But what really struck me about the accusation is that those making it apparently just couldn't believe that the nation's most prominent civil rights leaders used to speak this way about problems in the black community and the role of personal responsibility. Now, King was obviously a uniquely gifted and capable leader. And I'm not suggesting that black people today need another Martin Luther King. They don't. What I'm suggesting is that King represented a type of leadership, a type of thinking, a good faith approach to closing racial divisions that politicians and social activists today barely even give lip service to. King and his generation of leaders believed that whites obviously had a role to play in changing a fundamentally racist system. But they also understood that blacks had a role to play and they were willing to hold blacks accountable despite the white racism, the legal and rampant white racism that existed at the time. They asked something of black people. They operated under the belief and tried to instill in young people the belief that blacks must succeed notwithstanding these racial barriers, that blacks can't sit around waiting for whites to get their act together first. By contrast, many activists and politicians today who express concern about the plight of the black underclass ask almost nothing of blacks. They spend much more time, <clears throat> they spend much more time making excuses for the kind of antisocial behavior that prominent black leaders of the King era regularly condemned. Young black kids are sent out into the world with a chip on their shoulder. They're told the cops are gunning for them. Their teachers are racist. The tests are racist. The employers are racist. The judges and prosecutors, an entire justice system is stacked against them. They're told the world owes them. And that if they don't succeed, it's not their fault. So at a time when young blacks today are far more likely to experience racial preferences than racial prejudice, at a time when you have a generation of blacks who came of age with a twice elected black president, we have people in positions of influence and authority insisting that blacks can't be held in any way responsible for these persistent racial gaps until white racism has been essentially vanquished from America. In many cases, you're dealing with black leaders and activists who consider any focus on black responsibility or accountability to be itself a form of racism. And the academic and political and media establishments, for the most part, play right along. The discussion of race and crime today is a good example of this phenomenon. In the media, on college campuses, among civil rights activists, 
political figures, even in the world of sports, a fundamentally dishonest narrative has taken hold. The press is very eager to break down police shootings by race, but hesitant to break down criminal behavior by race, which gives the public a very distorted picture of what's happening. Study after study, going back decades, has shown that blacks are arrested and incarcerated at higher rates than whites based on behavior. That doesn't mean that there are no racist cops or that no cops abuse their authority. But it's clear that racism in and of itself is an inadequate explanation for higher rates of arrests and incarceration among blacks. Now there's no complete national database on police shootings. Some police departments report more extensive data than others. And perhaps some uniform system should be put in place. I'd certainly have no objection to that. But the data we do have show that in a typical year, police are involved in approximately two or three percent of black shooting deaths. In 2019, for example, there were 492 homicides in Chicago, but only three involved police. As I watched the George Floyd protest this past summer, I kept thinking about that statistic. 492 homicides and 489 of them had nothing to do with police. If Chicago has a policing problem, it's clearly a second order problem. Chicago's first order problem is crime. And most crimes are not being committed by and large by police. During one weekend in Chicago a couple years ago, 74 people were shot. One of the local hospital emergency rooms had to shut down turn away ambulances because it didn't have room for any more bodies. Again, none of these shootings involved cops, not one. Young black men in Chicago or Baltimore or St. Louis may indeed leave the house each morning worried about getting shot, but not by police. But you'd never know this following the media coverage. The media has fed the public a storyline about race and policing that serves the interest of activists and liberal politicians, but that cannot be supported by facts and data. Fatal encounters between police officers and black suspects are always unfortunate, and sometimes they're tragic, but they're also exceedingly rare. Nor is it rational to conclude without any supporting evidence that these encounters are driven by racial animus. According to a Washington Post database, police shot and killed 999 people in 2019, including 424 whites and 252 blacks. 12 of the black victims were unarmed versus 26 of the white victims. Now in a country where annual arrests number more than 10 million, if those black death totals constitute a quote, epidemic of police use of lethal force against blacks, then the word epidemic has lost all meaning. Back in New York City, where I'm based, we have the nation's largest population and largest police force. And it so happens that the New York Police Department has kept detailed records of police shootings going all the way back to 1971. That year, 1971, police shot 314 people, 91 of them fatally. Two decades later, the number of police shootings in New York had fallen from 314 to 108. 
and fatalities had fallen from 93 to 27. The most recent numbers I've seen are from 2019, when New York City police shot 34 people and killed 10. So we're talking about a roughly 90% reduction in police shootings and police shooting fatalities in the nation's largest city with the nation's largest police force over the past 50 years. And New York is no outlier here. Police shootings have fallen dramatically nationwide and in other major cities over the past half century. Meanwhile, we have social activists claiming that police shootings are not only rising, but have reached epidemic proportions. It's another example of how our prevailing narrative can be almost completely divorced from the empirical data. But if we want to begin to do something about social inequities, we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to correct the false narratives that so often drive the discussion. According to federal figures, police shootings with black people have fallen by more than 70% nationwide since 1970. This idea of a trigger happy cops out there today, systematically gunning for young black men, based on everything we know is a myth. Yet we have entire movements today advancing this narrative and the media expressing next to no skepticism. We had street protests all summer long based on this narrative. We've had pro athletes refusing to stand for the national anthem in protest of cops targeting young black men. Again, they think there's some epidemic going on out there. It's a narrative that has gained tremendous currency based on anecdotal evidence, social media videos that have gone viral, but no empirical data support this narrative. It's as if we've reached a point where the facts don't matter. All that matters is controlling the narrative. The media would have you believe that the main problem in our inner cities is policing. But the sad reality is blacks are only about 13% of the US population, yet commit more than half of all homicides. Roughly 7,000 blacks are murdered each year, and 90% of them are killed by their peers. There's your epidemic. In New York, which is one of the safer big cities in the US, Blacks are less than 25% of the population, but commit 75% of all shootings. Whites are 34% of the population in New York, but commit less than 2% of the shootings. And this isn't a New York phenomenon. You'll find similar numbers in Detroit, in Cleveland, in Oakland, in Philadelphia, in Baltimore, and other large cities. In fact, homicide is the leading cause of death for young black men in the US. And it's not because cops are killing them. Bad cops should be called out and punished. And I think the activists are performing a public service when they call attention police misconduct. The problem is the overemphasis on police behavior. If you believe that these lives really matter, if you want to reduce that black body count, then just as a practical matter, should your main focus be on the 2% of black shooting deaths that involve cops or the 98% that don't? This national discussion about race and crime is important because the violence that is so prevalent in these neighborhoods has enormous social and economic consequences as well. And it ought to be part of any serious discussion of what's driving social inequality in this country. The common assumption is that poverty leads to crime, 
But the truth is closer to the reverse of that. Businesses flee crime-ridden neighborhoods. Jobs follow. Property values fall. I think it's also important to note that the level of social pathology we see in black ghettos today isn't normal. Things haven't always been this bad. Here's William Julius Wilson, the black sociologist, describing Harlem and other poor black neighborhoods in the 1940s and 50s. Wilson writes that despite the high rate of black poverty, neighborhoods throughout the first half of the 20th century, despite the high rate of black poverty in neighborhoods throughout the first half of the 20th century, the rates of inner city joblessness Teenage pregnancy, out of wedlock births, female headed families, welfare dependency, and serious crime were significantly lower and did not reach catastrophic proportions until the mid 1970s. Wilson says that there was crime, but it did not reach the point where people were fearful of walking the streets at night. There was joblessness, but it was nowhere near the unemployment rates we saw in ghetto communities beginning in the 1970s. There were single parent families, but they were a small minority of all black families and tended to be headed not by unwed teenagers, but by middle-aged women who usually were widowed or divorced. There were welfare recipients, but only a very small percentage of families could be said to be welfare dependent. In short, says Wilson, Unlike the present period, inner city neighborhoods prior to 1960 exhibited a sense of community and explicit norms and sanctions against aberrant behavior. What Wilson is describing leads to a very unsettling conclusion, which is that blacks living under Jim Crow conditions and only a couple generations out of slavery had more stable families and lived in safer communities than blacks living under a twice elected black president. Now, why is that? Well, for the first half of the 20th century and well into the 1950s, black marriage rates in the US were either similar to white marriage rates or higher. In the 1940s and 50s, Black labor participation rates exceeded those of whites. Black incomes grew much faster than white incomes. And the black poverty rate fell by 40 percentage points. Between 1940 and 1970, so this is during Jim Crow segregation and prior to the era of affirmative action, the number of blacks in middle class professions, accountants, engineers, teachers, social workers, lawyers. The number of blacks in these professions quadrupled. Between 1960 and 1970, black incomes in the US doubled. They rose for whites during that decade as well, but not as fast as they rose for blacks. In other words, during this period, racial gaps were not just narrowing, but narrowing in some cases quite rapidly. Steady progress was being made. It was being made during a time of rampant racism. It was being made when blacks had very little political clout. One reason that blacks were progressing at much faster rates in the first half of the 20th century, when black political power was minimal and racism was legal and widespread, is that black communities were much less violent. The homicide rate for black men fell by 18% in the 1940s, and then by another 22% in the 1950s, all the while remaining relatively flat for white men. It's not a coincidence that black poverty fell dramatically over the same period, and that black incomes were rising. Let me close by saying this. Most sensible people agree that racial prejudice not only still exists in this country, but can in fact impact a group's progress. 
The relevant question is to what extent does racism explain these racial gaps we see today in poverty, in employment, in crime, education, and so forth? And to what extent can other factors explain them? For various reasons, I don't think our politicians and policymakers and activists spend enough time considering the non-racial factor. And that's the problem. Our intellectual elites identify one factor in racial inequality and determine that it is the factor. We've been here before. A hundred years ago, during the progressive era, the consensus view among intellectual elites was that genetics were responsible for disparities among groups. Today, the assumption is that discrimination, systemic racism, unconscious bias, etc., is the sole reason or the main reason we have unequal outcomes. But you can't simply presume such things. You need to make an argument based on facts. Downplaying group behavioral differences or shielding people from any responsibility for their situation may seem like the charitable thing to do in light of all the atrocities that blacks have endured in the United States. But the relevant question is whether it's helpful. More than anything else, the black underclass needs the human capital, the values, the habits, the attitudes, the behaviors that facilitate economic advancement, regardless of who gets elected. A previous generation of black leaders understood this. An unprecedented black advancement was the result. My hope is that this history informs our current debates about inequality. I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jason Riley, for that enlightening presentation. Uh, you did receive quite a few questions. And uh, I'll go over those with you now. If you want to view them, um, there's a Q&A icon on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, but uh, for the sake of recording, let me let me read them. So uh, there were a couple of questions related to your Thomas Sowell documentary, but I'll save those uh, for later. For later. Uh, by the way, I also want to apologize to those of you that joined us at eight o'clock, expecting to. Uh, see Jason Riley's presentation at that time we were delayed a little bit uh, as we ended the screening of that that earlier documentary okay so uh, here's a, here's a question from uh, Bryant Windham who um, does great presentation filled with facts are you familiar with the works of Claude Anderson such as power Pornomics? If so, with your research on Thomas Sowell and your works, how would you say Thomas Sowell's works and your works align with uh, Carl, with Claude Anderson? I'm not familiar with uh, with Claude Anderson's work, so I can't answer that. Okay, uh, Brian, maybe that's a topic uh, we could discuss over in our community. Um, here's one uh, from. Bryce, do you think social media has influenced these false narratives? Oh, ab absolutely. Um, I don't think there's really any doubt about that. In fact, I, I, I think we're we're seeing empirical studies that 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 show that. And 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 here's how. Um, uh, what 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 happens is that. Uh, when these incidents occur, particularly I'm speaking about uh, confrontations between um, uh, police or law enforcement and black suspects and and uh, are caught on on camera phones and so forth, um, they're picked up by uh, social media, cable news, and so forth, and they're played in loop, and they receive more attention than they used to. And 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 people uh, naturally assume uh, that because they receive more attention, they're happening more often. And and that's an assumption we can't make. Um, the empirical data we have shows, uh, in fact, a, a decline, as I noted in in my remarks, uh, 
in terms of lethal force uh, used by police against black, black suspects. And that, again, has been shown empirically in a number of studies. Um, but the, the, the media's role here has been to uh, uh, suggest, uh, through its coverage of these incidents, that, uh, that they're happening more often. And, and, and seldom does the media bother uh, to, 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 to cite the data that would allow people to put these, these events into perspective. And, and I may just add that when, when the media wants to do that, when it wants to put something in perspective, uh, or into context, it's, it's perfectly capable of doing this. And I'll, and I'll use the example of um, um, when uh, illegal immigrants uh, commit crimes. Uh, we we uh, every every so often we'll we'll, we'll hear about a, a drunk driver or or someone who was deported or snuck into the country, committing some awful awful violent crime. It will get covered. And, and the press will, will go out of its way to tell you this is not representative of immigrants in America or even illegal immigrants in America, that uh, this, this event to be put in context, that violent crime overall is down. It will show you the statistics on, on, on violent crime among immigrants and so forth. And they're absolutely right to do that. Uh, the question is why they don't do that when there's a police shooting, even though the same holds true. These incidences are rare, not representative, and have been declining for decades. So, so when the media wants to put these into context, it's perfectly capable of doing so. But uh, increasingly today, we have a, a, a media that has its own agenda, and it doesn't involve uh, putting these things into context. Uh, I can't help but observing that you're a member of the media. So maybe yes. you have some insight as to why this might be happening. And I'll tie this into your documentary about Thomas Sowell, who was always trying to explain things using incentives. And in your view, do incentives explain the difference between the way the media might treat those two types of incidents? Well, the, the media has always lean left. Uh, the mainstream media, the political media, the uh, Washington media. And, and again, there are studies showing this. Um, uh, upwards of 80, 85 percent of the Washington press corps uh, votes for Democrats. Uh, that's just the reality. And that's been the case for decades. And so um, obviously, I think uh, this is going to inform their coverage. Of, of of what's going on, uh, how they do their job. Um, I, I you know I I'm uh, an opinion journalist. I'm a columnist. I'm paid to 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 express my point of view, uh, not to be objective. I mean my 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 goal in, in in my day job is to make sure my opinions are informed, um, uh, and that's what I try and do. But I'm I'm. I'm called on to give an opinion. Uh, but when the, you know, the White House correspondent for the Washington Post or the New York Times is sounding off on Twitter or Facebook and sounds no different from Jason Riley, <laughs> we have a problem. The, 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 the <laughs> and, 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 and that's what we have today. And that's the, the, the problem that I think social media has exacerbated. Uh, you have the White House correspondent for various mainstream uh, influential news organizations uh, sounding off under the banner of their employer on social media and then turning around and writing news stories in their papers pretending to be objective. And I think it's only undermined the, cre the credibility of, of, of my profession. The, the, the press hasn't done itself any favors in recent years. There's a question about the survey data. I think this actually relates to the point you raised near the beginning of your presentation, where you said 81% of black Americans surveyed actually favored more policing, I believe, was the, oh. was the statistic. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a question about that data and how um, 
how was that sample? How large was that sample? Was it potentially biased? Um, so, so the person wants well, to know a little bit about. Sure, Th those are Gallup polls I was citing, um, and um, Gallup has asked this question over the years, going back decades, and it's been quite consistent. The, the, that that 81% is not an outlier. In fact, I could have cited data going all the way back to the 60s and 70s. And in fact, if you go back to uh, black newspapers based in places like um, uh, Harlem in New York City or Chicago, the Chicago Defender, if you go back and read their news coverage, because in the 1960s, there was a huge spike in violent crime in America. If you go back and read their coverage in the 1960s and 70s, even in black newspapers, you will, you will, they will sound, it will read like the, like Fox News coverage. It, it, the, 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 the anti-crime uh, position, uh, the, the, the focus on policing, the complaints about the lack of good policing in these neighborhoods and how these criminals have the run of the place and how this should not be allowed and how we need better crime control uh, was was commonplace back then in black communities. The, the, uh, the, those, the, the polling data I'm showing is representative of, of, of attitudes in black communities going back a half century in this country. It is by no means cherry picking. And, and that can be shown empirically if anyone wants to bother to do so. Um. I noticed you focused on lethal force, and based on the title, um, are police picking on black Americans? Uh, if we were to go into other areas of policing, traffic stops, for example, driving while black, um, would, would the data be similar, or is there evidence that uh, there's biased policing uh, that doesn't rise to the level of lethal force? Well, the studies that I've seen um, consistently show no bias uh, in the use of lethal force. Um, one of the studies, uh, this one in particular is by uh, a Harvard economist named Roland Fryer, showed that when it came to non-lethal force, um, he saw evidence that blacks were more likely than whites uh, to be treated differently or, or more likely to receive harsher non-lethal force than whites uh, from police. Um, use of a nightstick or shoving or, or, or what have you, but non-lethal non force. But what Fryer also said is not support attributing this to racism or bias. He said that when you take into account crime rates among blacks versus crime rates among whites, uh, this disparity could be justified. So again, when it comes to lethal force, he saw no evidence of bias, nor have other uh, researchers who have studied this. When it comes to non-lethal force, he sees disparities, but he doesn't attribute them automatically to bias. In other words, I, I think the, the, the one way to put this is that there's a reason why the, what's, these communities draw police attention, and it has to do with crime rates. And the crime rates are, are highly disproportionate, as I got into in some detail in my, in my talk. And so um, when you take into account that disparity, the disparity in crime rates, um, it largely uh, accounts for the behavior of policing. Um, again, we, we th th there are outliers here. Uh, I I'm not going to pretend, and no one should pretend, that there aren't uh, police who abuse their authority, or that there aren't bad cops, or that there aren't racist cops. Um, I certainly would not make that case. But in the main, uh, what we see when it comes to the behavior of police uh, can largely be explained by looking at 
uh, the disparities in who is committing crimes and who is committing what kinds of crimes, particularly violent crimes? Well, there's a related question here. Um, it brings up the uh, stop and frisk policies. And um, Justin says, your presentation says no, but the facts that you presented tell a different story. Stop and frisk targeted many more blacks than whites, despite making up such a small portion of the population in New York City. So how can you explain this? Um, it, it appears to contradict your your point. No, I don't, I don't see a contradiction. As I as I explained in uh, citing the data on who is committing crimes, um, the stop and frisk uh, policy that resulted in a disproportionate number of blacks being stopped and frisked um, is in accordance with the proportion of crimes, and particularly violent crimes, committed by blacks in New York City. I don't see a, a contradiction there or disparity there. The, 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 the other uh, reason we know that these communities are not quote unquote over-policed has to do with what crime victims tell us in surveys. In other words, um, uh, every year uh, surveys of, are taken of crime victims, and they are asked um, to identify the perpetrators of the crime. And we assume that people who are victims of crimes have no reason to lie about who the perpetrator was. And what you find in this data consistently, year after year, decade after decade, is that the same proportion of crime victims who identify blacks as their assailant uh, aligns with the arrest of blacks by police. If police were over policing these communities, those two uh, things would not be in alignment. You would find that police are arresting blacks at much higher rates than victims of crimes identify blacks as their assailants. But you don't find that. You find these two numbers largely uh, reconciling one another. And that is, again, another empirical way of showing that these communities are not being over-policed. Uh, the, the police are in these communities because this, the, this is where the 9-11 calls originate. Black people call police more often than any other group. Uh, that, that, that is the reality. Police are are, are, are being asked to come into these communities, and, and that is why they are there. So we have a few questions related to some changes with the 1960s, apparently, uh, that crucial period. Uh, one, a couple of the questions deal with the civil rights movement and how the uh, philosophical, I guess, uh, the philosophical perspective of the civil rights movement changed from Martin Luther King's approach, and you quoted Dr. King uh, in your comments, to one which is uh, different now, and uh, critical race theory is a different approach that's gaining traction. Uh, what, how, how do you account for these changes? Are civil rights leaders today uh, different in their understanding of these problems than, than the leaders of an earlier era? Well, well, yes, they're, they're very much so. I mean, to start with the critical race uh, theorists, um, again, th th these are folks who ask nothing of black people. Uh, and, and critical race theory is, uh, says that, that uh, all black problems um, can be blamed on whites and are the responsibility of whites to solve. Uh, that, that, is, that is critical race theory in, in, in a nutshell. And, and uh, uh, that is not the approach that the King uh, uh, era of civil rights leaders took. 
as I as I said in my remarks, King was very much thought that blacks had a role to play in addressing racial disparities, um, and and that this was not simply a matter of pointing out the shortcomings of white people. Critical race theory is all about about nothing else other than pointing out the shortcomings of white people. It is glorified white shaming. That is what critical race theory amounts to. And that is not the approach that a previous generation of black leaders uh, took. So no, the, 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 those two things. I mean, just think about it on its face. I mean, uh, 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 Dr. King uh, preached a, 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 a sort of color blindness, judge me, by uh, the content of my character, not the, the color of my skin. The movement today is called Black Lives Matter. And if you say all lives matter, they get upset. It is turning King on its head. I mean, so, so I, th there's no uh, doubt in my mind that, uh, that, 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 that these two movements are coming at it from, from very, very different directions. But, but the bigger, I think um, uh, issue with respect to the shift in the civil and the, the leadership of the civil rights movement that occurred in the '60s um, was the shift away from uh, a focus on equal opportunity to a focus on equal outcomes, and uh, and and moreover a focus on attaining political power for blacks in order to obtain those equal outcomes. Uh, and so what you saw following the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was an emphasis on electing blacks to office. And the thinking was that if black people had more political clout, that in and of itself would be enough to address uh, racial disparities in other areas, education, income, employment, and so forth. And on, 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 on those terms, um, the strategy has been quite successful. In other words, uh, blacks today have a tremendous amount of political clout. And, 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 and you know, look, just to give you some numbers, in, 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 uh, between 1970 and, 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 and 2000, 10, 2010, the number of black elected officials in America rose from fewer than 1,500 to more than 10,000, including, of course, eventually a twice elected black president. But even before Obama came along, you had uh, black mayors of large cities with black populations from you know, Los Angeles and Chicago to Detroit and Cleveland and New York and Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. and so forth. You had uh, blacks uh, in, in state legislatures. Uh, you had black governors, you had black school superintendents and police chiefs, um, you had uh, black congressional caucus, you had racially gerrymandered voting districts to ensure the election of black congressmen. But all of this black political clout never translated into the reduction of, 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 of racial inequality that, that the black leadership uh, and the black civil rights leadership said would come from it, and uh, and and that that I think um, is 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 where the, uh, the the civil rights leadership of of the of the 1960s took a wrong course. Um, the, 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 the 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 focus became less about developing uh, human capital among blacks. Uh, educationally, economically, culturally, and so forth, and more about achieving black political clout. But the, that black political clout has not paid, paid uh, the dividends that, that we were told it, it, it would pay. And, and to, to get back to, to, to Tom Sowell, who studied this, um, he, he is not at all surprised by that, because if you look at other racial and ethnic groups that have risen from poverty to prosperity, uh, not only in the U.S., but in other countries around the world, um, uh, politics has generally not been the route they've taken. They've established themselves economically first. And that's whether you're talking about um, 
uh, Jews or 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 Asians or 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 other groups. Um, and and those groups that have gone the political route, and the Irish are one example of that. You had uh, Irish political machines dominating cities like Boston and Philadelphia and New York uh, in in the in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, but the Irish middle class was 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 nowhere to be found. Uh, the Irish incomes and so forth were not growing at the time when the Irish were dominating politically in these cities. In fact, it wasn't until the decline of these political machines that you saw the rise of the Irish middle class to the point where today Irish Americans are uh, are well above average in everything from incomes and, and, and education uh, and so forth. Um, so political clout is one way to go, but it's clearly not the most efficient way to go when it comes to a group rising, uh, an ethnic or minor, or, uh, racial or ethnic group, a uh, minority group rising economically. And that seems to be the route that, that, that blacks have taken at the direction of the, of the black civil rights leadership. So Jason, I, I have a question uh, for us here at Northwood University. Uh, you mentioned when you arrived here uh, that you don't take for granted your freedom to speak at, at various campuses. And, uh, I appreciate uh, the fact that, that you observed that. We do think that Northwood is a uh, unique school, that, that we are uh, one of those places where, where ideas can be discussed and debated openly. Uh, what do we need to do? Um, what can we do or what can we teach to raise all lives in America, um, black lives, and in general, generate that human capital. Well, I, I, I think institutions of higher education um, should be focused on being platforms for open debate about all of these controversial topics. I mean, the problem um, to my mind is that uh, the focus these days seems to be on uh, teaching young people um, what to think instead of how to think. To give you, to give you uh, some context for this uh, in relation to Thomas Sowell, the video you, you, you just watched, um, Sowell uh, once explained that uh, in, in his early days, Sowell was a Marxist and um, and 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 uh, taught uh, Marx uh, in in the course of teaching economics at various universities uh, across the country when he was in academia. And uh, after uh, one course on on Marx that he taught was was finished, some some students in the class approached him and they said, Professor Sowell. We, we really enjoyed this class on, on Karl Marx, but we still have no idea what you personally think about Karl Marx. Hmm. We were just curious. And Sowell said, that was the highest compliment they could have paid me because it was not my job to teach them what I personally thought about Karl Marx. And I, I think, you know, you know, there, 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 there are some, uh, there are some on, on the on conservatives uh, in the academic world who think that um, what we need in higher education is to counterbalance the number of liberals on campus with the number of conservatives on campus. But um, I kind of take Sowell's view here. The, the, the goal should not be to provide some sort of counterbalance. The goal should be to get uh, this sort of thinking out of the classroom. Uh, the, that, it, they're, 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 uh, the goal should be on, on teaching kids how to think critically, uh, the difference between a slogan and an argument, how when someone says something you disagree with, your goal shouldn't be to silence them. It should be to debate them, to provide a counter argument. And uh, to the extent that, that higher education has gotten away from that, um, that that to me is 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 the problem. Thank you. And uh, I realize that uh, we are imposing 
uh, on you by uh, running a little late here. So I, I would like to uh, perhaps do one more question, if you can stay with us sure. for that. Sure. Um, so, um, boy, there's there's a lot of questions here. I am going to go with, with this one because it gives you an opportunity to uh, close the way perhaps you would like to close and to share your final thoughts with us. So um, Kimberly says, Mr. Riley, you stated that blacks are raised to think that the world owes them something. Can you expand on this and what data do you have to support that? Oh, the reparations debate. What, do you need data on that? Have you heard about that? That's been out there for a while. Reparations is an argument that America owes black people. Uh, I don't know uh, how, to, how to state that more clearly. I will put it in this context, however. There, there is a view um, among, among many people, uh, many intellectuals, uh, that the, that the normal state of things, uh, the normal state of human affairs would uh, result in equal outcomes among groups or proportionate outcomes among different racial, ethnic, gender groups and so forth. In employment, in incomes, in home ownership, in representation in certain professions, law, medicine and so forth, that, that but for something being amiss, something uh, uh, being wrong, or some nefarious third-party actor. But for that, what we would see in society are these proportionate outcomes among races and ethnicities and genders. But people who have actually looked at this, at societies, not only today, uh, and not only in the U.S., but worldwide and down through history, have never found anything resembling this proportionality in outcomes that is set up as the norm. And, and, and again, that is something people should think about when we're talking about social inequality, and economic inequality. Uh, what is the norm, or what do you think the norm is? And, 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 and when you don't see what you think is the norm, what are the causes behind that? Um, as I said in my remarks 100 years ago, the assumption among intellectual elites was that it was genetics. They were wrong. Today, the assumption is that it's discrimination. It's systemic racism or bias or prejudice. I, I find that unpersuasive as well. There are many explanations for why we don't have uh, uh, equal outcomes or proportionate outcomes. But the basic explanation of this is that it's not normal. It's never happened. It's utopian. And, 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 and we shouldn't hold up something that is utopian as the norm and assume that where we don't see it, uh, something is amiss or, 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 or something, uh, there's some villain out there that we need to go after. Uh, and, and that is too often what underlies our discussions of inequality in America today. And so, um, uh, again, Thomas Sowell is someone who has spent uh, decades um, uh, sorting through uh, this sort of discussion on 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 on, on human nature, on on the history of inequality, uh, what has driven it, uh, what are rational expectations, what are the trade-offs when we try to produce equal outcomes, uh, and and so forth. And and I think um, that is very much a, a discussion worth having. But uh, we can't have it if, if people are holding up something as utopian uh, as the norm. Uh, and that, I think, is, is what often happens today. 
Well, uh, thank you uh, for your, your time today, Mr. Riley. And uh, I appreciate the columns that you write on a regular basis for the Wall Street Journal. And I urge our audience to uh, keep up with those. And uh, you'll learn a lot, a lot more from uh, Mr. Riley in the future. So once thank again, thank you. Appreciate your time this evening. Okay, thank you. And I thank uh, our audience for being with us tonight. I ask students who are taking this for academic credit to stick around. And for the rest of you, please join us for our other scheduled presentations. Um, you can find the complete schedule at our website, northwood.edu slash freedom-seminar, Northwood Freedom Seminar. Thank you and good night.